We're very pleased to have with us tonight Dave Croft. He's the Conservation Project Manager over at the Mariners Museum. He's doing work on the monitor. So will you please join me in, work in welcoming Dave Croft. How's everybody doing tonight? Before I get started, I just want to ask a question. How many of you have been to the Mariners Museum before? Most of you guys. So I'm hoping that all of you have heard of the USS Monitor before. Most of them. All right, well, tonight's presentation is entitled Conserving the USS Monitor. Now, what I want to do is give a brief introduction so you know what we're going to be discussing tonight, and it will give you a better idea of some of the topics we'll hit on. First and foremost, I'll do a brief look at the history of the wreck as well as the recovery of the USS Monitor, an overview of treatments that we've done at the museum for the past decade or so, and kind of give you an idea of what conservation truly is. What are we doing in the lab? What does conservation mean? I'm also going to mention artifact treatment timelines and how they come into play with planning for this project, as well as a few other things like the differences between metal and organic artifacts and how we treat them. Collaboration with Jefferson Lab. Fortunately, we've had some great assistance from Jefferson Lab here at the Art Center, and it's been a lot of fun to work with them. Uh, lastly, some outreach that we do to the museum, similar to talks like this, and finally, a conclusion. Now, if you've been to the Mariners Museum before and the USS Monitor Center, you may recognize this image. This is a shot of the inside of the wet lab, and you will notice some very large tanks. Notably, this tank here, which houses the USS Monitor's revolving gun turret. It's approximately 90,000 gallons of water. This is the steam engine right here, and the visitor experience right here. If you come to the museum, you walk up the staircase, you can see a lot of these activities that happen day after day after day. So you can keep progress on what we're doing in there, and there are a couple other ways to do that, which I'll talk about in this bit. So the USS Monitor, famous Union ironclad, first of its kind constructed in New York. What we're looking at is John Erickson, who's a Swedish-American engineer who designed the ship. Very, very creative guy. He wanted to try out something new, using his ideas to make a very, very, very formidable warship. The monitor wasn't very big. This is a great plan view of the ship, and you're seeing the length of it here, just over 170 feet, and I'll point out some very notable features. Most obvious, the thing people most recognize, the revolving gun turret. It's about 20 feet in inside diameter, has two very large guns, which weighed about eight tons apiece, and that was it. Two guns on an extremely famous warship. Doesn't sound like something you'd expect. We're used to seeing many, many large guns on big wooden sailing ships, but this is a whole different concept. You'll also notice these blue lines right here. That's indicating the water level. So what we're seeing is a ship that is almost 90% submerged. So although it was not actually a submarine, it's fairly close to it. I'm also going to point out these features right here. This is the propulsion assembly, the steam engine, steam condenser, propeller shaft, and propeller. Note again that these features are mostly underwater, so they're not prone to enemy fire. This means that during battle, compared to a sailing ship, if your masts or sails were destroyed, you could still have power. Almost impossible to put this thing out of commission. So, Battle of Hampton Roads, March 8th and 9th of 1862. Very, very famous battle. Uh, the first day was an extremely, extremely tough defeat for the Union Navy. They had blockading vessels not far from here, out in Hampton Roads Harbor. The CSS Virginia, this ironclad vessel right here, the Confederate or Southern ship, was actually formerly a Union wooden sailing vessel. It was burned and then converted to this ironclad. So this came out March 8th, prior to the monitor's arrival, and attacked the Union blockading fleet. Sinking the Cumberland and the Congress, hundreds died, destroyed a few other transports, and believe it or not, March 8th of 1862 was the first defeat, uh, the worst defeat from the U.S. Navy prior to Pearl Harbor. So a very, very significant event. That night, after the first day of the battle, the monitor shows up after steaming down from New York, gets into position to try and protect some of the remaining wooden ships from the fire of the CSS Virginia. So March 9th, they square off for about four hours, point blank range at times, trading fire. Essentially, despite all the smoke and noise and commotion, Standoff. Not a lot happened. What we did know was that after this battle, if Union and Confederate navies wanted to be competitive and if all navies of the world wanted to remain strong, they would have to adopt ironclad technology. March 8th proved that ironclad ships were capable of destroying superiorly armed wooden 
the ships. And then the next day showed that these two vessels, when squaring off, would be the future of all navies of the world. So pretty significant battle. Not a lot happened to the Monitor in the months that followed. A couple forays up the James River, a little bit more time floating around the Hampton Roads. Unfortunately, when headed south to engage in other combat, the Monitor sank right off Hatteras, North Carolina, 16 miles south-southeast of Hatteras. Started out fairly calm, the seas built, became very rough, and ultimately the ship's pumps and other devices used to get water off could not keep up with the incoming water. This is a great painting. It depicts the Rhode Island, which is this vessel right here. It was actually helping to tow the monitor down to the southern ports. Unfortunately for the crew that was aboard the monitor, they were rescued for the most part. Now we do know from survivors accounts that certain crew members were washed overboard. We know that some stayed below decks. And believe it or not, when we did recover the revolving gun tour, we found two sets of human remains. So that night of the sinking, 16 crew members perished. Four officers, 12 enlisted men. So essentially, it's also a war grave down here. A very, very tragic episode. Uh, but as we know later on, more ironclads were built to help follow up this technology. Now, discovery. It wasn't until August of 1973 that the wreck site was discovered off North Carolina. Great picture right here. This shows what the ironclad looked like on the bottom of the ocean prior to any recovery activities. And there's some pretty significant things I'd like to point out. First of all, this is the revolving gun turret. As we know from that plan I showed you earlier, that was originally in the center of the ship. But right now, this is the stern. This is the back end of the ship, and the gun turret has moved that far. So basically, what happened when the ship sank? It flipped over completely and slammed into the seabed. The gun turret, which spun freely and rotated on that ship to allow the ship to fire in any direction without having to move, in order to rotate, could not be fastened to the hull. So it was supported by its own weight on the cradle. Subsequently, ship flips over, turret comes off, and drifts down its pin beneath the stern of the ship. This is early, early sonar image right here, showing me that classic shape that we saw in the earlier drawing. A neat point to make here is that there's some indication that during World War II, American ships that were patrolling the coast detected this on the bottom and thought that it may have been a U-boat resting there. So there's evidence that suggests the wreck site of the monitor was actually depth charged by the U.S. Navy. Uh, so it might explain some of the damage that we see on the wreck site. We'll take a look at that in just a minute. But again, for more geographic detail, here's the monitor right here. It's about an hour and a half boat ride out of Cape Hatteras. That is the Monitor National Marine Sanctuary. It is administered by NOAA, and they are the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Most people think weather, fisheries, but they are also in the overall marine preservation business. And they operate a series of sanctuaries around the country. Uh, Monitor was the very first sanctuary and had quite a few different goals here. First and foremost, preservation and interpretation of what is down there on the seabed. All right, recovery and initial stabilization. Over the past 10, 15 years, there have been various recovery operations at the wreck site. The propeller came up in 1998. It was one of the first larger artifacts that was treated and on display at the museum. 2001, people will remember the engine was recovered as well as some other propulsion assembly components. Most notably, 2002, August, the revolving gun turret in the top left picture here pulled out of the ocean after years and years of hard work and planning. That gun turret is shown right here after being transported to the Mariner's Museum. What you'll notice is that inside of this upside down gun turret are some pretty significant structures. This right here is a gun carriage. This is what the two big guns rolled back and forth on. Still intact, still in place, and you see the barrel of the gun. Well, this is 2002, 2003, this is 2006. What you'll notice is that the gun carriages have been removed and removed a lot of that thick sediment which forms in artifacts. We typically call it concretion. It's a matrix of sand, shell, coral, basically a hard layer that forms over the majority of our iron artifacts. So now, with the carriages and sediment gone, you see this nice smooth cast iron gun right here, the other gun right here, and a lot of the features inside that help to make this gun turret stall, uh, strong and formidable. Another major operation was removing the guns for independent treatment from the turret. That involved us actually disassembling part of this structure which was over top of our heads. Now keep in mind, when we're working in this gun turret, we're walking on the ceiling because it did flip over 
landed upside down. So we were actually disassembling part of the flooring to allow the guns to be removed. And lastly, this is what the gun turret looked like right around 2008. You'll notice the ceiling structure right here, those parallel beams, that's actually railroad iron. And that shows us a couple of things. It was a strong, quick, and cheap, readily available material. This ship was built in just about 100 days. So in order to make a state-of-the-art vessel quickly, it was a matter of utilizing existing products and parts, obviously custom building certain things, putting it all together to make the final product. So railroad beams, you'll also notice these vertical features. These are what we call mantelettes. They're pieces of wrought iron that have actually been placed over these fasteners. Think about putting together the gun turret, many, many hundreds of pieces of iron plate bolted and riveted together. You have many exposed fasteners on the inside. John Erickson was concerned that if the ship were to take a strike from the outside, enemy cannonball, those bits would break off and fly around and shrapnel and kill the crew. So his idea was to put these features in place to help protect the crew. And what we found out is that a few of those features actually are bent from the force of cannibals knocking those features off and getting stuck on the inside. So they were very, very effective. All right, a decade of accomplishments, not to brag, but we've done a lot in the past 10 or so years. 1999, before the major recoveries, we have about 180 artifacts that were recovered from the wreck site by NOAA, by the US Navy, and by the museum. And you'll notice just a sliver of those have been conserved. As the recovery operations kind of geared up and really got into major way, by 2002, with the gun turret, we had over 800 artifacts recovered from the wreck site. It's a pretty big number, 800 artifacts. Since that time, though, there have been no recoveries at the wreck site. But you'll notice in 2009, we had about 1,400 artifacts. So where did all those artifacts come from? That's from excavation of the artifacts that were recovered by the Navy, by NOAA, by the Marriage Museum, at the museum. We pulled an additional 600 or so, I'm sorry, additional 400 artifacts out of the gun turret alone. So these are all things that we weren't necessarily expecting to find, but we did. More iron pieces, gun tools, personal items from crew members inside of the gun turret, two sets of human remains, the gun tools that help the crew use the guns in the gun turret, a variety of artifacts. So even though NOAA and the Navy and the Museum expected to have a gun turret, they didn't necessarily anticipate all these extra items. So all of those are now under our care as well, being concerned. So right now, as it stands, we've treated about 350, 370 of those. So we're about a quarter of the way through. We still have a lot of work left to do. And when I say conservation, what, what does that work mean? What does it mean, Dave, you're conserving an artifact? Well, it's a very, very long and in-depth process. And not all of it is hands-on activity. If you've been to a museum before and you've seen the exhibit, you'll notice that a lot of the tanks have water with the artifacts sitting in them. And it doesn't look very glamorous. But that's one of the most important things we're doing. I'll touch on that just a little bit. But before we can even lay our hands on these artifacts, we have to work on stabilizing them prior to treatment. Think about a shipwreck that has stabilized itself over 140 years in the ocean. And we're taking these major components, removing them from the wreck site, and putting them in entirely different conditions. Most notably, the major result is heavy, heavy corrosion in these newly exposed areas. So before we can even do anything to the artifact, we have to make sure that we're halting that corrosion. So using these iron artifacts as an example, we put them in a special solution, very high pH, and that helps to allow us to soak these artifacts but prevent them from rusting. So pre-treatment stabilization is a very, very important thing, especially when you have 1,400 artifacts. The next step is to examine and document what you have. Before you can treat it, you have to know what it is, what it's made out of, many different steps that go along, involving a lot of analysis. I'll talk on some work that we've done here, courtesy of Dr. Michael Kelly and a few others at Jefferson Lab. But we really need to get a good idea of what it is we're working on. Then we can proceed with our treatments. Now the treatments are different for different material types. I will discuss that in further detail. But the main bulk of what we're doing is trying to remove the harmful salts that have built up inside of the artifacts. Um, that's where the soaking comes in. We're trying to remove these things slowly over time. I wish there was some formula where we could punch in our numbers and determine exactly how long it would treat, how it would take to treat each artifact. But basically, it's a matter of testing and sampling the solutions, the artifacts, and determining where we are in the treatment process, which is the second point of analysis here. Lastly, once the treatment is complete, which could be a few weeks, a few months, or even a few years or a decade, that's when we have to make sure they're stable enough for storage or display, depending on where they're going to go. So it's a very, very detailed process. This is an image of an intern 
few summers back, helping to remove those layers of sediment from inside of the revolving gun turret. And this is Colleen, one of our former conservators, doing the painstaking work of reassembling some shattered glass from a lantern recovered from the USS Modern. Lantern is beautiful. It looks like something you'd see you do. All right, so I'm talking about a lot of treatment times, a few weeks, a few months, a few years. Well, it's pretty significant when you have 1,400 artifacts. The mechanical components that I mentioned earlier, the pumps that we used to help get the water off of the ship, and a few other ventilation engines, things of mechanical nature that ran under steam power that are small, those will be mostly complete by 2010 to 2012. So we've been treating those for a few years, and we're anticipating just a little bit longer. The Dolphins, the big massive guns that I pointed out, we're hoping by 2013, 2014, you know, another three, four years, they'll be out safely on display in the open air where people can view them. The gun carriages, they're not as big as the guns, but they're extremely complex. I'll touch on those a little bit. They have different material types that offer some unique problems. Those will be a few years later, followed by the condenser, the engine in 2025, and the turret hopefully completed by 2029. Now, the image on the bottom, I really like it a lot. This was taken by a, a researcher who visits the site periodically, and he stood in the very center of the revolving gun turret. He took his camera and he just snapped pictures, spun around, and he spun around, and he spun around, and he spun around. And what he did was actually mosaic these on a computer. And basically what we're looking at here is the interior of the gun turret as if it's been rolled out flat. You'll see those vertical features I talked about earlier all over the inside of the turret. You'll also notice a couple neat features right here and right here. Those are dents. Those are dents, however, that are caused on the inside of the turret, not the outside by enemy fire. Now we did read surviving accounts, crew members' letters home, a variety of different uh, archival sources stated that when the guns were originally test fired, they slammed into the rear wall of the turret. That's neat to know, but it wasn't until we excavated the sediment that we discovered the archaeological details to support that story. So we didn't take measurements off of these, and they matched the exact dimensions of the cascabel or the very rear portion of each gun. So there's a lot of neat details inside of the gun turret. And also, this is the remains of a dent from the exterior of the gun turret. There are a few more here and there. Just, you know, different features in there that kind of tell the story of what it was like to serve on board. All right, why not sooner? I'm talking 20 years from today's date, 19 years. Why can't we speed this up? Well, I mentioned chlorides. Those are our salts that are inside the artifact. We have to soak them out, safely remove those. If you think about driving a car up in New England where they salt the roads in the winter, lifespan on those cars is a lot less. They tend to corrode quicker. Same problem here. We have to get those salts out. Uh, sulfur is another problem. It's part of you know, the underwater environment as well as the corrosion process. We get deposits of sulfur in the artifacts. It's primarily problematic for the organic materials, which we'll talk about in a little bit, but those will, when reacting to modern treatment materials that we use, cause sulfuric acid to form over time. This is a newly discovered problem that's, that's kind of uh, problematic for a lot of conservation projects around the world. But basically, the artifacts will become so acidic that they'll just eat themselves up from the inside out. So it's our job to try and carefully remove that as well. Why, why not sooner? I talked about the chemical side. What about the manpower side and the physical things that we have to do? This is a Worthington pump, one of two. This was used to help pump water out of the bilge as well as move water to the various components on the ship. Notice this thick, thick layer of marine sediment or concretion that I mentioned earlier on the outside. We know we have to remove that to allow our treatment solutions to contact the original metal. But before we can do that, we need to know what's underneath it. So this is an x-ray that we took. Actually, it's many x-rays we took at the shipyard down north of Grumman. We piece these together and it provides us a complete view of what is under that concreted sediment. We'll see flanges, spring valves, all kinds of original components. So we know what to expect and where it is on the artifact. After we've done that, we can safely remove that concreted sediment with a variety of hand tools and some electrochemical methods. And this is a great shot of Pedro, one of our senior conservators, midway through that surface cleaning process. You'll notice we've disassembled this top component, completely gone here. He's removed this entire end of the assembly and is slowly cleaning it. The last image on the bottom right is that same pump, but disassembled into all of its component pieces. Now, for artifacts that are extremely fragile after corroding in the ocean, you're probably thinking, why would we ever want to take these things apart? Does that risk damage? Yes, it does if it's done properly, but every surface where these artifacts are tightly bound together, it's not so tight that the chlorides and salts couldn't get in there, but the corrosion layer builds up and then locks those in place. So unless we can separate these out to get those chlorides out, we're in trouble. If we were to just leave this intact, rinse it off, it would completely corrode and fall apart over a duration of a few years. 
Another reason for disassembling, different material types. Something like this pump contains cast iron, wrought iron, copper alloys, bronze and brass, rubber gaskets, a variety of materials. There is no single method that can treat all of those things together. So by isolating them, we can guarantee more effective treatment, and then we'll reassemble them at the end of the process. So it seems very scary and crazy, but it's completely doable, as is evidenced by the amazing looking components here midway through treatment. This is just kind of summarizing those points. Um, again, these are the things that really add to the length of the project. And anything that we can do to shorten these are really important. All right, so let's talk about some of the pieces we're actively working on right now. This is a shot of the proposed engine recovery, 2001. And this was July when the engine finally reached the surface of the ocean right here. This is the barge, the recovery barge, and that's the engine right there. It's about 12 feet by 12 and a half feet by about six feet tall. So to give you some scale, that should cue you into this whole process here. It weighs about 30 tons. Now, similar to these little pumps right here, we have to disassemble this thing completely as much as we can. So composite artifact, full disassembly, this is what it looks like as of a few months ago. What we did was went in the tank and we surveyed this thing, photo documentation, and we're basically formulating our disassembly plan. Right now on paper, using the original archives, the original construction documents, we have to find the safest way to disassemble this and to treat it piece by piece for long-term display. Now, you'll notice that thick marine sediment all over the surface of the artifact. You can see these little things right here. These are oyster shells. So what happens when you take an artifact out of the ocean in the middle of July, truck it up to the museum in Newport News, and leave it out in the sun for a little while? It stinks. It stinks bad. We had visitors showing up at the museum, getting out of their cars, and smelling this thing from across the property. I mean, a really, really tough stench. But the first thing, again, is to get it wet, make sure we're keeping it moist, soaking out those salts. I broke out these smaller images here, showing these different material types. You can see the rust color here. That's obviously iron, but these are copper alloy oil cups right here, and valve handles used to help oil and operate the machine. Those must be removed, treated separately, and then reassembled again. So very, very, very tricky process. Steam condenser, this is a less known component. Uh, it did help make the engine more efficient. Basically, it was converting extra steam or waste steam back into water to help make the system operate a little bit easier. Unfortunately for a guy like me, it operated on salt water rather than fresh water. So during the life of the ship, it was already corroding probably a little bit on the inside. But this is a great example of disassembling multiple material types. Primarily an iron object right here after surface cleaning. You notice the differences between this and the engine? Well, this is a rubber gasket right here. Believe it or not, rubber was commonly used back then. This is layers of rubber and textile kind of joined together, and they are all over our mechanical pieces. And you notice some deformation just from problems in the ocean, but we were able to cleanly remove this without even making a mark on it. So it really helps us out quite a bit. And this valve right here, you can see it intact here on this assembly. This is it after being removed and partially cleaned up. So it gives you an idea of what it is we're dealing with on a daily basis. All right, 11-inch Dahlgren guns. I said they weigh 8 tons earlier. They're obviously not 11 inches long. That refers to the diameter of the bore, basically the size of the shot that would be fired by the gun. You saw in the top picture earlier, what we're doing is actually performing electrical reduction on these guns. It's a process in which we're running a negative electrical charge into the artifact in order to help force out those negatively charged salt ions. We want to force those out. At the same time, we use anodes inside of our tank and run a positive charge through them. Those are helping you attract out those negatively charged chloride ions. This is happening in a very, very active solution, sodium hydroxide. It's very conductive to allow this process to work a lot easier, and the pH is high to prevent rusting. So it's a very common thing you'll see in the lab. If you notice a lot of wires coming out of rectifiers and different materials over top of the artifacts, that's probably a good indication that we're running some type of electrolytic production. All right, Dahlgren gun carriages. This is a good comparison here of some of the activities that we're working on. And this is Pedro again, and what he's doing, it looks like he's taking a torch to cut the wheel off. That's a definite no-no, that is not what he's doing. We cannot deliberately cause any damage to the artifact unless it's for a very, very good reason. What he's doing is trying a different method to help us remove very, very thin layers of concreted sediment. On some of the artifacts, the iron artifacts, that, that concreted sediment might be six, eight, even 10 inches thick. It's very, very easily removed by hand, hammer and chisel, a variety of other tools. But that's not a method you can utilize when the concretion is a sixteenth of an inch thick or a thirty-second of an inch thick. So what we're doing here is actually 
heating the moisture that is trapped beneath that concreted sediment to the point where it boils. It's also causing physical change of the concreted sediment itself, and it will literally pop off in pieces when we heat it with a torch. It's not hot enough to modify the metal, just hot enough to boil the water and to cause that concretion to come off with no visible harm to the artifact. So it's something we're exploring, but obviously it has a very limited role. It's not something we can do very easily or effectively on iron. Uh, it's also not something we would do in the presence of wood. So again, this is on a copper alloy component that's very good and conductive, so it works out quite well. Things that help us out with our disassembly and our activities, these are examples of original plants that show the construction details of these carriages. They are extremely helpful. And if you're interested in seeing some of these materials, they are in the library at Christopher Newport University. That's where the museum's archives and the NOAA collections are now housed. It's a brand new facility. So the museum is fortunate to have its archives and library collections over there. Great research opportunities for people. All right, one of the recent things we've been doing is trying to write some of our upside down artifacts. This is a gun carriage, and before we do our major disassembly procedure, we want to get it right side up. It makes it a lot easier for us. So Gary, this guy you see right here, he's the brains down in the lab. He constructed a device that allowed us to safely rotate the carriage without physically having to do a lot of rigging to the artifact. We placed a steel frame on the underside, which is the current top side of the artifact, and wrapped that around with some all thread so it was secured firmly to the carriage. We then lifted it with a crane and placed it into this little frame. You can see Will right here rigging up some of that securing device. And then using the overhead crane, we slowly pivoted the gun carriage from one end and up and over to a completely vertical position. See the activity right here? This is, this is the critical point we reached past vertical. Gary's helping to pull it back this direction. And you'll see in the series of images, we finally have it to its original upright orientation. So, doesn't seem like a big deal. It took a couple hours, but the planning for that was a few months. So when you take into consideration what it is we're doing, we're moving and handling a very, very fragile piece of material, cultural heritage from the ironclad USS Monitor, we have to be very certain we know what we're doing and that we can do it safely. Lastly, a shot of us moving it back into the treatment tank where we can perform more disassembly. Prior to disassembly, we did a little three-dimensional scanning. This is a uh, basically a non-contact method where we can document every feature of the artifact without even having to touch it. We can take very accurate measurements off of that, print two-dimensionally and three-dimensionally from that. So it's a neat technique we're trying to explore for future treatments. And then lastly, this is initial stages of disassembly. You can see it's kind of dirty work, boots on, sediment, a variety of different things. You can see all this from the viewing platform at the museum. All right, revolving gun turret. I've already spent some time on this, but I wanted to show you a few more images. Uh, primarily composed of wrought iron. There are about 192 wrought iron plates that are one inch thick, bolted and riveted together that basically make this major structure right here. This is an overhead shot showing the guns and carriages in place. Um, I talked about disassembly for the engine, the condenser, the pumps, those mechanical pieces. It's not yet something we have fully considered to do for the gun turret because it's primarily a single material type. Um, with that thought in mind, I'll jump ahead a little bit. We wanted to determine the, if there were salts or chlorides in between those individual layers of armor, as well as other problems that we might anticipate. So we received permission from the superintendent of the monitor sanctuary and his boss to actually drill a small sample of metal from the interior of that revolving gun turret. I mentioned we never want to do any deliberate harm unless there is an end goal. If the results of this core allow us to make a more educated decision regarding disassembly or not, then it's something that is 100% worth doing. So we're still having some work done by a professor at Old Dominion University. This is a little bit of surface analysis here, non-destructive, using a little bit of radiation. And what we're doing is trying to determine exact elemental composition, um, as well as detect some lighter elements that would help <coughs> indicate what we should do with treatment. Um, currently, if you go to the museum, you will see it soaking in a tank, desalinating. And that's what it's going to stay here. It's very stable right now. It's advancing through the process. But we're focusing our main efforts on those composite artifacts like the engine which are suffering a little bit more because of those different material types in contact. All right, organic materials. I'm talking about an ironclad, I've been talking about metal and machinery, but ultimately there are a lot of different materials on there that most people don't associate with the wreck. By organics, I mean anything that is cellular based. Rope, wood, wool, <coughs> leather, basically natural products. I talked about rubber and bone. On the left, you'll see a Wellington style boot recovered from the inside of the monitor's gun turret. We know that boots were fairly expensive at the time, and this may be a piece of property from one of the officers on the ship. You'll also notice these buttons right here. 
USN, the United States Navy, three stars and an anchor, as well as we have on the back Goodyear Rubber Company, New York, with the patent date. We think about Goodyear tires, we think about modern things. Nope, they were back in business in the 1860s and before. So again, all kinds of different materials on the ship, different treatment needs. This can't be in the same solution that our big turret is, so we have to be very specific and very focused in how we're handling these artifacts. And I believe the size of the boot is a nine and a half. Don't write that in ink, but I think that's the modern equivalent size. So everyone, you know, the old, the old saying is everybody was smaller back in the day. Well, you know, this is 1860. It's not very long ago. We found features on the inside of the turret, sight holes that are five and a half feet up off the floor, which to me indicates if you're a six foot male now, take about six inches off the top. So we're talking same size individuals. So the jackets, the buttons, the organics that we find would fit anybody that would be there today. All right, this is the remains of a wool coat discovered inside of the turret. Think about a wool coat, the footwear, the buttons. What we're doing is basically through the archeological record identifying what it was like the night of the sinking. Imagine chaos, the ship's rocking in 20 foot seas. People are seasick, they're trying to get off. They want to get onto the rescue boats from the Rhode Island. But you don't want to hop in the water with your wool pants, your wool coat, your heavy boots on. So people are stripping out their clothing, buttons popping off, taking boots off. We're talking about a major, major chaotic place to be. And that's exactly what the archaeological record is showing us. Uh, a couple other features, both found inside of the gun turret. This is a wooden drawer. There was no real reason for a wooden drawer to be inside of the gun turret that we're aware of. We also found about 20 different pieces of silverware, forks, knives, spoons, some with sailor's inscriptions engraved on them. Those are all visible at the museum. Go there and check them out. But why we would have a large collection of organic materials and silverware inside of the turret, anybody's guess. So again, chaos. People may have been trying to take things off the ship to save them, but all found inside of the turret. The job of archaeologists to determine why they were there. Lastly, this strange piece. This is the head of a gun tool. This is a wooden section right here with a copper sleeve wrapped around it. This was likely used to help remove shot and shell that had not been fired. This would have been shoved down the barrel of the gun. It would have been closed around the material, and the crew could have safely extracted that from the gun. And also, bottom right picture is a freeze dryer. We would never freeze dry a revolving gun turret. It's simply too big, and it's not really an applicable method for us. But what we're trying to do here with our organic materials is quite different from the metals. Think about a tree. I like to use the example of driftwood. You have a big tall tree that's standing up over the bay. It falls in the water, it soaks up all of that moisture inside the cells. It'll soak up so much water that all those cells will actually rupture, will break open. But the thing doesn't fully collapse because that water tension is holding that tree in its original shape. The tree eventually washes up on the beach, water evaporates, drips out. There's no longer anything supporting those cells. So the whole thing collapses twists and checks and splits and breaks, and that's what gives it that weird, strange appearance that we're used to. Well, our wooden artifacts and organic artifacts have been soaking, and if we simply dry them out, with that much cell damage, they're going to collapse and fall apart. So what we do is actually insert a basically inert material, polyethylene glycol. It's in toothpaste, it's in shampoo, it's in everything you need, probably. It's, it's a good bulking agent. What that does is goes in there and fills up those spaces where those cells have collapsed. And then we freeze that artifact so that watery, waxy mix is frozen. And we place it in the freeze dryer. And what we're doing is taking that water out, basically subliming it out. We're going from a solid to a gas, and it's gone. What's left inside is that waxy, inert material that you can't really see, and it does the supporting job of keeping that artifact intact and together. So, wholly different approach from what we're doing with the metals. All right, a little shout out here the Jefferson Lab, the Applied Research Center. We have been fortunate enough to work with Dr. Michael Kelly, Amy Wilkerson, and Olga Trofimova on a lot of different uh, materials analysis. I mentioned some of the fun things we have in our lab that help us treat artifacts. But in some cases, we lack analytical techniques that allow us to make informed decisions. And we've been very, 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 very lucky to participate with some of these experts at the Art Center here. Um, William and Mary's Materials Characterization Lab has offered us some training and time on their equipment and that allows us to get the information we need to make more educated treatment decisions. And this is all right here in the lab, telling us what we're doing wrong and what we should be doing instead. So they're very, very helpful. Um, we hope to collaborate more in the future with Jefferson Lab. Um, a couple of things that we're doing outreach-wise in order to get our story out. Um, 
First of all, the website is a great resource. Mariner'sMuseum.org. Mariner's Mariner's Go check it out. You'll be amazed at the amount of content that we have there. And we try to make it as interactive as possible. One of the neat newer additions to that website are the live webcams. If you are at school and you're not paying attention in class and you want to see what's happening in the lab, you can go online, check out the webcams, and you'll see the activities that are taking place there. If you're overseas or in a different state and you're interested in the project but you can't come by the museum, these are live, they're running 24 hours a day, you can see the activities as they happen. In conjunction with that, we have a blog which we update on a weekly basis, sometimes more than that. And what we'll do is post upcoming activities that we have so people can know when to tune in, when to see what's going on, and kind of stay up to date on what's happening in the lab. Again, we're talking about 20 years of work, so a lot of things are going to happen. It's, it's a great way for us to quickly update the general public on what it is we do. We also operate some educational programs and packages through the museum, as well as at outside places like this where we do lectures and presentations, and also behind the scenes tours. A lot of your hands went up when I asked if you've been to the museum before. How many of you have been on a behind the scenes tour before of the lab? Five, six, seven hands. So, reason enough to come back and check out the museum. So, why is conservation so critical? Why am I talking here for 45 minutes about trying to restore some old things from the bottom of the ocean? Well, yes, it's technology. Yes, it's history. Yes, it's important. Uh, you know, I can talk here all night about steam technology or conservation science or chemistry, but more importantly, we are telling a story. We're telling the story of the men who fought during the Civil War, who participated in this historical event, and really trying to tell their story and get that message out abroad. Now, we don't just talk about the monitor. You know, we get a lot of grief. How come you don't have the Virginia? We're in Virginia. Well, we do have Virginia artifacts, but we represent the story quite well, trying to tell both sides why the conflict, what happened as a result. So I really recommend you come back, take a look at some of these things again. It's very important that we get this message out. And this is a great quote. So long as we remain a people, so long will the work of the monitor be remembered and our story told to our children's children. That's what we're trying to do. With that in mind, I'm going to make the shameless plug here for the Battle of Hampton Roads weekend at the museum. Friday and Saturday, this week, come to the museum. Friday's a neat day called Living History Day. We have um, great actors and interpreters there kind of explaining what it was like to be alive back then, to be involved with this type of thing during the Civil War. Some very unique uh, educational programs to support that. Also, Saturday, there's a neat thing going on, a jury youth art exhibition. We have submissions from all over the country, and I think a few international ones. And those will be judged at the museum on Saturday for a variety of different categories, primarily K through 12. So it's a really neat opportunity. A couple more presentations, uh, slightly different from this. And lastly, those behind the scenes tours I was talking about. Come by on Saturday, sign up. We're doing nine tours Friday, nine tours Saturday. 15 people a tour, hottest ticket in town. So if you're interested in coming and seeing this stuff up close, we'll have some of these big artifacts out of the tank, conservators working on them. Certain things that you can't see from that viewing platform will be completely visible as you scroll through the lab. So I encourage you to come by. Again, thank you to Jefferson Lab for the opportunity to talk here. I'd be more than happy to field any questions. Do we, do we have any questions? Yes, sir. That's a good question. Uh, oftentimes, we have copper and iron components. They're flanges that are bolted together. And the iron typically tends to corrode a lot faster when in contact with the copper alloy. So with some of those connections, the bolts are completely gone. There's nothing left. So all we have to do is separate it once the sediment is removed. So that helps, but at the same time, that means it's a little bit weaker there. We have to support that while we're working. In other cases, we have bolts that are this long, this big around, nuts on the end that you know, still have good intact surfaces. The trick is either building new tools, new wrenches, or adapting industrial size equipment for our applications. Now, I'll use a, a propulsion assembly component as an example. The bolts were about this long, and they had double nuts on the end that had to be basically taken off. And we took these big wrenches, put them on, and put a big pipe on the end. So we had a ton of leverage, and we just moved it. And once that corrosion seal was loosened, we just walk up to it, 
and just backed them, backed them off and you got them in your hand. So the parts that aren't exposed to the ocean and that maybe had some original lubrication put on to help them go together tightly, perfectly preserved. So we can just back them off by hand. It's, it's pretty amazing. Yes, sir? Were any artifacts ever recovered from the Cumberland There are a few. The Hampton Naval Museum, which is down in Norfolk, they have, I think, a couple artifacts from the Cumberland and the Congress on display. I don't know the exact number or what exactly they are, but I know that certain artifacts are up top side that have been conserved and can be seen. I'm sorry? Uh, good question. He wants to know when I wanted to, when I knew what I wanted to do or, you know, work on modern artifacts. And that's a tough question. I went to school to study business and then I realized I, I didn't like business. I did okay at it, but it wasn't something I was enjoying. And I found myself reading history books instead. So I slowly started following what I was really interested in the most. And after a variety of years of schooling in different locations, I ended up at the museum working on something that I was really interested in. So that kept my attention. So think about what it is that you really like to study or read about, or even if it's not something that's directly at school, but another hobby or interest of yours, and try to become very, very good at it, become very skilled at it. If you follow that along, ultimately you'll end up someplace you really enjoy. Are there any surviving written records that uh, tell you anything about the ear damage of the sailors inside uh, these things that they fired the guns? That's a good question. He's asking about if there are any documents that suggest that there was damage to the ears of the sailors who were inside the gun turret. Um, I don't. We don't know of anything in particular. I, I've heard you know, third-hand accounts of somebody claiming they read something where people were putting cotton in their ears to help protect them from the noise. But think about two eight-ton guns basically firing inside of the confines of that gun turret, which is going to hold the majority of that sound in place. We can only imagine how loud it was. We've seen smaller reproduction guns at the museum fired, and they're enough to blow your eardrums out if you're standing right by them. So I have to imagine it's pretty permanent and devastating for the, for the guys inside standing next to those guns. Yes? Okay, the scout right here is asking if any more pieces are going to be brought up from the wreck. Right now, there are no plans to bring up anything new, but that doesn't mean the future of resources will allow us to maybe I try to answer some questions on different sections of the wreck. We don't just want to go down there and scoop things up and bring them back to the museum. We need to have a reason to go down there. So if the archaeologists have questions or the historians have questions about the wreck, and maybe why certain things are the way they are, they might try to plan and organize an archaeological expedition down there that would include recovery. So right now there aren't any plans, but that's not to say that in the future we won't bring back some new pieces. So as we treat these ones and empty the lab over the course of the next 10, 15, 20 years, there will be available space for additional artifacts and monitor or possibly other wrecks if they're recovered. Yes? The smallest artifact. The smallest artifact. Hmm. We have pieces of glass that are probably about a millimeter in width, very, very small. Um, we have small buttons, you know, the size of like a button on your shirt right now. Uh, what else that's pretty small? Oh, some really neat pieces of ammunition, small bullets, basically unfired cartridges were found inside of the turret, about the size of probably your pinky finger. We have a total of five of those, and those are being conserved, and they'll probably be on display pretty soon. But small artifacts, yeah, we have a lot of big artifacts, not quite as many small artifacts, but there's a variety of them on display. Yes, sir. Mention briefly the process for digging. I know it was exploded, uh, and the fellow shaft is a rich museum. Do you have are there other artifacts that have been covered in what's been done for that? Right. We have a few pieces at the museum that are reportedly from the Virginia or the the Merrimack. It's kind of a I'll clarify, the Merrimack was a Union or Northern sailing ship. It was in the Hampton Roads area for some repairs. And when the Union or the North abandoned the Navy Yard, they actually burned it. And of course, it's not going to burn when it's sitting in the water. So the hull was well preserved. The Confederates came to the yard, floated it, and built a new iron casemate on top of it and renamed it the Virginia. So you'll either hear the monitor versus the Merrimack or the monitor versus the Virginia. It depends on what you're hearing. Um, we have some pieces that are from the Merrimack. The wooden ships, so I don't know if they were removed for repairs at a given point in time. We also have pieces from the Virginia. We have a section of iron armor plate, two inches thick. It's about, about a foot long. And there's a huge cannonball dent in the middle of it to show the effects of the damage on these ships. So there are a lot of pieces out there. Um, 
that's reported that if you were to count up all those pieces and add them together, you'd have like two or three Virginias. So it's really up to you to kind of sort out the convenience of the artifacts, but some of those are pretty well defined. I'm glad you mentioned that. There was a cannon that was damaged March, March 8th of 1862. Part of the barrel was blown off, either by the Cumberland or the Congress, those big wooden ships that they were attacking. That gun was damaged and was then removed from the vessel. It was later recaptured by the Union when they took the facilities down there in that area. That gun was then considered a war trophy. It's a little stamp trophy number one. It had an unbelievable inscription on the side. That was property of the Navy and was up in the Washington Navy Yard on display there for a while as a trophy. Then it went to Fred or Dahlgren, the Dahlgren Naval Weapons Facility in Northern Virginia. It was there for a while on display. Outdoors, kind of falling apart, you know. It didn't suffer from the same amount of problems that modern artifacts did because it was never in the ocean. But it still had some surface corrosion. Then it moved to Fredericksburg, where I got a fresh coat of paint and sat outside of Fredericksburg at the Fredericksburg Air Museum. And fortunately, we received that gun on a long-term loan from the Navy. And we did what we would consider a conservation treatment on it. Cleaned off the old coatings and paintings. The inscriptions just jumped right out of the gun. Beautiful. We put on a very thin protective coating, and now it's at the entrance to the Monitor Center inside the Mariners Museum. It kind of greets you with a nice pow right as you walk in. So if you, if you haven't seen that up close, it's pretty amazing. So there are a lot of pieces out there. Other question right there? Well, there are, there are a lot of cannons that have been recovered um, in general from the ocean, from lakes, from rivers. Are you asking specifically from the Monitor or the Virginia, one of those vessels? No, the Virginia. Oh, the Virginia. Well, I don't really know. Um, they did intentionally run that ship aground and exploded it so it wouldn't be captured and probably used against the South. I don't really know if they took the guns off beforehand or if those guns were left on the ship when it was blown up. Um, that might be a good question for you to look up online. You might be able to find some good information. I really don't know. Yes, Did you find any money? Money? Yeah. Uh -huh. Any coins? Good question. Well, next to the two, or, or in close association with those two sets of human remains, we did find personal items. Uh, one of them was actually a wedding ring on one of the hands of the sailors, a fully articulated skeleton that had the ring on it. In close association, we also found fragments of pencils, you know, wooden pencil with lead and sort of graphite on the inside. Uh, we also found what we believe to be pocket contents. Very close to the hip of one of those sets of human remains was a concreted mass. It was kind of hard to identify. But as we cleaned it up, we noticed, and we did some x-rays on it, we noticed it had a couple coins in it as well as a skeleton key, a key. Now, we weren't able to identify the monetary value of the coins, what kind of coins they were. They were very, very badly corroded and deteriorated. But, yeah, we found some more. So. <laughs> Have you uh, done any research on the battle that Drury's brought involving the money? I haven't done much of that myself. I know a lot has been done by people. We, we have being in a historical society, mm -hmm. that's how the river. We've heard stories that was the Virginia gun crew that was set up on the bluff. We've heard stories that used the guns from the Virginia, or they used already in place guns, and were able to file down on the monitor and it eventually retreated because it couldn't return the rate of guns enough to return five. Right, yeah, I don't know how high Drury's bluff is actually elevated above the river. Monitor and a few vessels did try and go up midsummer and approach Richmond on the river. I know that certain members of at least one of the gun crews from the CSS Virginia was up there on the bluff, I think possibly with one of their guns, but it's neat to think that the guys who battled against them earlier were up there on the bluff firing back down. Now, monitor's guns could only go five degrees up or five degrees down. We were very limited to how high or low they could shoot. If you think about a modern battleship, you watch it on the History Channel or out there at the Wisconsin, out there in Norfolk, those guns are doing all kinds of crazy elevations. Monitor was extremely limited, so if you think about a cliff that's extremely high up and you can only raise your guns five degrees, you're not going to be able to hit the top of the embankment where the other guns are. So they got pounded. They took a pretty good beating. Um, some minor damage, some of the other ships were, were in a bad way, so they ended up turning around. So I guess it could be stated that you know some gun crew from the CS of Virginia helped defend them off. And, yeah, and we understand that on the way to Richmond, they shelled Fort Hugh. <clears throat> on the outer white side, which is up about 30 feet. 
Okay. And that's a beautifully reconstructed uh, point. If anyone gets over to that white side, you can see where the monitor went. Right. Yeah, I wasn't aware of that. That's great. Very interesting. Just opened last year. Thank you. Is there one other question I saw? Yes, sir. Uh, you showed the picture of the turret on the bottom of the sea floor with the ship on the top of it. Right. How was it actually moved out from under, under the ship and kept the whole thing up and dragged it out? That's a good question. Um, and that's very easily answered if you come to the museum. But <laughs> <laughs> there's a really neat recovery theater that we have. It's high def footage, and it's all about the recovery of the turret in the summer of 2002, narrated by Sam Waterston from uh, Law and Order fame on TV. And it's pretty neat. It's high def footage taken by divers underwater. There's little interactive handrails where you can, you know, he'll ask you a question, you can chime in at the right time. But basically, it tells you the operation to try and remove that. It did involve removing a section of the armor belt. That big portion of the outside portion of the hull was actually you know, kind of deteriorated and pulled off to the side. Most of that superstructure over the top, the original hull, was primarily wood. You know, the main iron portions were topside. And so a lot of that in the thinner angle irons badly deteriorated. So most of that turret was exposed with the exception of that piece. So it was quite an operation to remove that section safely off to the side to allow the equipment to come down and make a good contact with the turret to lift it out. But I'm, I'm serious about that video. It's pretty sweet. You gotta check it out. You guys, we can thank our speaker one more time, please.